Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started. Welcome to uh, UBI's Grand Rounds, or uh, the uh, Ophthalmology Rheumatology Interface. Uh, I will begin with an overview of uh, uh, non-infectious uh, uveitis new treatments and current treatments. This will be followed by two case presentations uh, illustrating the treatment of ocular-only inflammation and then ocular inflammation associated with systemic diseases. Uh, and then that will be followed by a talk on an update on biological agents for the treatment of non-infectious uh, uveitis by Dr. Gobi Pemetsa, who is an assistant professor of ophthalmology and rheumatology and our collaborator. So for some reason, this is not advancing. Great. Okay, so uh, the, our approach to the treatment of non-infectious uveitis begins with establishing a diagnosis and of course excluding infection, and then putting out inf inflammation with corticosteroids by any means necessary from any route necessary depending upon the type of inflammation we have in the diagnosis. And then having a very low threshold for the implementation of immunomodulatory therapy in patients with chronic inflammation in order to either spare steroids or use as a first line agent. And this consists of both conventional and biological agents. In essence, the goals of our treatment are to eliminate inflammation with prompt control of activity um, and hopefully induce a remission uh, in an effort to prevent ocular structural damage that is essential for vision and to avoid or minimize systemic complications. In essence, to have our cake and eat it, and I think that this is possible. In essence, the choice of treatment with steroids and immunomodulatory therapy will depend upon several factors, including the anatomic site of the inflammation, the severity of the inflammation, the laterality of the inflammation, and the underlying diagnosis. So uh, topical steroids is appropriate for anterior uveitis only. Periocular steroids is, is appropriate for unilateral intermediate uveitis. Um, implantable devices are also appropriate for unilateral, more severe unilateral uh, intermediate uveitis and as adjunctive therapy for posterior and pan uveitis. And systemic steroids are appropriate for more severe inflammation, particularly bilateral inflammation, in which we expect a more prolonged course. And then of course, immunomodulatory therapy in order to spare steroids or as first line agent here are our, our choices today, uh, um, most for regional corticosteroids. Periocular corticosteroids can be administered transeptally or via posterior septinase injections in the slide above, or intravitreally uh, as triamcinolone or as the approved dexamethasone implant or Osdex, as I'm sure you are all familiar. We were a, a, a principal study investigator for the point trial, which was a randomized controlled uh, trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of regional corticosteroids for patients with active uh, uh, uveitis and macular edema. So we compared periocular versus intravitreal approaches and the Ozredex. And as you can see in this graph here, these are the intravitreal approaches and this, this is the periocular approaches. There's a statistically significant, clinically significant decrease in central macular thickness um, at eight weeks, which was the primary endpoint. In addition, there was a, uh, a statistically significant and clinically significant uh, improvement in uh, resolution of macular edema in the uh, intravitreal approaches as, as opposed to periocular. And there was elevation in intraocular pressure in all three groups, although this was greater for the intravitreal groups. So really in conclusion, all treatment groups had uh, improvement in central subfield thickness and uh, in best corrected visual acuity. However, this difference was much greater and uh, much better for patients uh, with intravitreal therapy and it suggests that the intravitreal uh, approach may be uh, the indicated approach for patients with central involving and vision threatening macular edema. Uh, we are also a principal investigator for a sister trial called the MERIT study that it is investigating non corticosteroid intravitreal alternatives for macular edema. And this is comparing dexamethasone implant, which we just saw here, to intravitreal uh, anti-VEGF, ranibizumab, and intravitreal methotrexate. Data is locked and we're uh, analyzing it, so stay, stay tuned. The problem with regional corticosteroids is that they are relatively short acting and hence less effective for chronic inflammation 
And so associated with the cumulative risks of uh, steroid exposure, such as cataract and intraocular pressure problems, and of course, of the procedure itself. Uh, back in 2005, uh, in order to uh, address this issue, uh, a fluxinolone, a cetinide implant uh, was approved by the FDA, which provides uh, sustained intravitreal steroids for about two and a half to three years. And this is surgically implanted in the operating room. Uh, this provides uh, effective anti-inflammatory uh, therapy with improvement of visual acuity, but as expected, adverse effects of cataract in 100% of eyes and a very high percentage of uh, elevated intraocular pressure and the need for incisional glaucoma surgery, not too unexpected for marinating an eye in steroids. Um, in uh, 2018, a variation on this theme of the flucetinone insert was approved by the FDA. And this is an office-based injection of the same uh, medication yet at a lower dose. And this was shown to have efficacy versus sham at 12 and 36 months with respect to inflammation and uh, a reduction in the loss of visual acuity, and ha but did was associated with cataract uh, formation and elevation of the intraocular pressure, but certainly not as great as that with the Redisert uh, implant. Probably its greatest utility is in uh, mild to moderate uh, chronic inflammation in the eye as it is a lower dose and for eyes uh, that are complicated by chronic macular edema. So I anticipate that the UT is going to be used for uh, uh, adjunctive therapy more often uh, than uh, as primary therapy because uh, many of these, many eyes with severe inflammation just, you know, will not respond to the dose of this medication. A really novel approach, which has recently been approved like a month ago by the FDA for the treatment of macular edema in non-infectious uveitis is supracroidal administration of triamcinolone. So animal models uh, have shown that supracroidal administration may be better than intravitreal as that higher amounts of drug get to the point of interest in the, in the retina and the choroid and lower exposure to the anterior segment, hence uh, less uh, intraocular pressure problems. And this was trialed in, in the peach tree trial, a phase three randomized control trial, uh, which compared uh, this uh, supracroidal administration at two different time points to quote sham injection. They, they were sham injected, but they were actually injected with local steroids. And uh, the primary endpoint was visual acuity and it met the primary endpoint end with 47% um, of study eyes uh, gaining greater than three lines of vision from baseline. Uh, as compared to 17% uh, controls. What was really remarkable was this robust uh, decrease in central macular thickness, which was sustained throughout the trial at 24 weeks of central macular thickness. So it appeared to be a very good treatment for macular edema. Uh, there were very few cataract uh, events as compared to control and very few intraocular pressure events and no need for incisional glaucoma surgery. So this is a promising technique. So almost two decades ago, there were guidelines that were published for the use of immunosuppressive drugs in patients with more severe posterior uh, and panuveitis uh, that was non-infectious uh, that had been on corticosteroids that require immunomodulation. And the recommendations of this uh, panel were failure of systemic corticosteroids, unacceptable side effects, diseases known to be poorly responsive to steroids, and we can go through some of those. And of course, the requirement for uh, chronic corticosteroids of greater than 7.5 uh, milligrams uh, per day, which is associated with uh, systemic side effects. In addition, this publication recommended that immunomodulatory therapy be commenced at the onset of treatment for certain diseases. Those included certain diseases associated with systemic diseases, such as Bechet's disease, or necrotizing sclerotis and peripheral ulcerative keratitis, with or without the association of an underlying systemic vasculitis, and then a whole host of just ocular-only um, inflammatory disease, including mucous membrane pemphigoid, uh, serpiginous cordopathy, sympathetic ophthalmia, BKH. And then it also recommended the early institution of corticosteroids uh, in, in eyes in which we know that natural history is uh, to poorly respond to steroid monotherapy, such as birdshot retinal cordopathy, certain cases of multifocal choroiditis, intermediate uveitis, and certainly JIA-associated urocyclitis. So just for a review, we can think of immunomodulatory as conventional therapy and biologic therapy. So the conventional agents are listed here and they begin with anti-metabolites that you're familiar with, and, uh, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and azathioprine, T-cell transduction or calcineurin inhibitors such as cyclosporin, tacrolimus, 
And finally, the alkylating agents, bromomycillin cyclophosphamide, which we use less frequently as we have now biologics available to us. But it's these agents that actually are the most likely to induce remission of severe inflammatory disease. So there are numerous case studies and case series that show the effectiveness of conventional immunomodulatory therapy in JIA, in birdshot retinochordopathy, multifocal choroiditis in PIC, PKH, and in serpiginous choroidopathy. Um, you are probably familiar with the MUST trial, uh, which was a, a multi-centered randomized controlled trial, which compared the, uh, the Redisert implant that I just showed to you earlier uh, versus conventional therapy with steroids and then conventional immunomodulatory therapy. And uh, so local steroids versus systemic steroids. Uh, and this was a very interesting study. At two years, the visual outcomes were about the same in both groups, but inflammatory control was achieved a little quicker and a little faster with the implant as compared to systemic therapy. Systemic therapy was very well tolerated. So many of you were not poisoning our patients or harming them. And of course there was uh, the expected ocular complications of cataract and elevation of intractor pressure. But at seven years, you can see that the implant did great for a while. And then there was a crossover at about five years in which the, the systemic group actually did better at, uh, at seven years. And this was due to recurrent uh, chorioretinal inflammation uh, in, in those eyes. And so basically the bottom line, I think is that either one of these approaches is certainly acceptable. Uh, systemic therapy seemed to be better in, in providing sustained inflammatory control in these eyes and hence better uh, visual outcome at seven years. So the um, availability of biological agents has revolutionized the uh, treatment of rheumatology, certainly, and uh, uh, we have stolen uh, many of these uh, approaches and drugs uh, for the treatment of UBIS. This is a kind of a short list of the, of the biological agents that are currently used in uh, uveitis treatment. The ones that you're most familiar with, I'm sure, are the TNF inhibitors. Uh, infliximab, which is a chimeric monoclonal anti-TNF antibody, uh, which is given IV, and adalimumab, or Primera, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody, which is administered subcutaneously and was FDA approved, the only biologic agent to be FDA approved for intermediate posterior and pan-uveitis 2016. Um, again, uh, a pa expert panel recommended the use of these biologic agents uh, as first-line agents for patients with Bechet's disease. And as second-line agents after failure of, com of conventional mod uh, immunosuppressive therapy in patients with JA-associated erythrocytitis, and as potential second-line agents for patients that may not tolerate or do well with conventional therapy, which include severe posterior uh, uveitis or scleritis. Um, I would just bring your attention to the fact that uh, there is a uh, randomized controlled clinical trial, multi-centered trial that is going on, of which we are participating called the ADVISE trial. And this is looking at Humira versus conventional immunomodulatory therapy uh, as, a, uh, as a primary endpoint of steroid sparing uh, therapy in patients with uh, intermediate posterior and pan uveitis. So uh, it will answer some important questions like, can you just go straight to a biologic, for example? Other biologic response mod modifiers that are used in uh, uh, ocular inflammatory disease include interleukin and receptor antagonists, such as abatacept, which is a, a, a co-stimulatory uh, blocker, which has been shown to be semi-effective in refractory JIA. Rituximab, uh, a uh, monoclonal anti-CD20 uh, on B cells, uh, which has been extremely effective in patients with refractory scleritis, mucous membrane pemphoid, and uh, refractory uveitis. Other biologic agents uh, that have been used, uh, interferon alpha 2A, the European experience suggests it's extremely effective uh, in Bechet's disease, although there are numerous side effects associated with this medication. A uh, application that is extremely effective uh, is uh, in patients with uh, recalcitrant macular edema. Uh, intravenous immunoglobulin uh, has been useful in patients with uh, autoimmune retinitis, uh, retinopathy, and uh, cancer-associated retinopathy. Emerging data suggests that tocilizumab, an IL-6 blocker, uh, which is a humanized anti uh, monoclonal antibody, which has been approved for various uh, uh, inflammatory uh, diseases, uh, is also effective in refractory UVS, particularly those complicated with uh, 
macular edema, as we'll see. And this has been shown in two phase two studies and, and some numerous case reports, and we'll see some of that later. So in summary, uh, there are disease-specific indications for treatment of uveitis, both for ocular only and for inflammation in the eye that is associated with systemic diseases. We take a kind of a stepped approach using corticosteroids, <clears throat> which is guided by the anatomic location, the diagnosis, the laterality and severity of the disease, and we employ conventional immunomodulatory and biologic agents uh, when needed in order to uh, spare steroids or as a primary therapy and or using uh, sustained release implants as either primary or more commonly as adjunctive therapy uh, for recurrent macular edema and inflammation in eyes that are already on systemic therapy. So the currently guarded prognosis for patients with severe inflammatory disease is possible with effective and sustained suppression of intraocular inflammation, uh, the early introduction of steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy. I think identifying eyes at risk for complications is likewise important. And then of course, studying the safety and efficacy of early introduction of these agents uh, and regional therapies in uh, well-designed uh, clinical trials. So I hope that provides a, a backdrop for what's ahead here. Uh, I would invite uh, Rachel Patel uh, to come up and uh, give us a case presentation on what's next. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, a particular uh, patient who might be uh, well known to many people uh, at Moran Eye Center as well as to Dr. Pimetza. Um, and so this is called Still Active, What Now? Part One. So this is a 59 year old woman. Um, she first comes to establish care in rheumatology clinic. She has a history of chronic erosive rheumatoid arthritis um, for which she's been previously treated in Mexico prior to immigrating to the United States. And um, it primarily affects her hands, her shoulders, and her feet. She also has diabetes and high blood pressure. She's on a Tanercept or Enbrel every week, as well as methotrexate every week. And after one year um, with reasonable control of her joints, um, her methotrexate is stopped. One month after stopping her methotrexate, she comes to the U of U ER um, and she has right eye pain and redness. And the good Dr. Bear was on primary call at this point and he accurately diagnosed her with scleritis and said, sounds like we need something uh, to help treat the scleritis. And she says, I've actually been seeing this ophthalmologist in town his name's Dr. Wyatt. I, he's been treating me with a sub T9 Skinalog every couple months or so. Um, and it's getting better, but it's not fully completely treated. So she um, is in coordination with Dr. Wyatt. She's discharged from the ER. She follows up in a rheumatology clinic, at which point she started on oral prednisone um, to treat the bilateral disease at 50 milligrams daily. Um, she's restarted on her methotrexate with the consideration that potentially that was one of the reasons why her uh, scleritis got much worse um, after stopping that. And it's recommended that she switched from Enbrel to Adalimumab or Humira. Um, as many of you know, uh, Itanercept has very little efficacy in uveitis and therefore Humira, the approved medication was something that could be an alternative to treat both her scleritis and her rheumatoid arthritis. However, she was getting her Enbrel through a hospital assistance program because she's uninsured. And so the Adalimumab switch was a little bit limited by her lack of insurance. She was lost to follow up for a couple of months, but then showed up in the uveitis clinic. At this point, you can see here that she's got um, diffuse scleritis of both eyes. You can see a little bit of the depot of the residual sub T9 skin log on the top of her right eye. Um, and she doesn't have any evidence of necrotizing scleritis at this point, which is great, but she also has had recent um, triamcinolone injection in the last three months. So potentially we're not seeing how severe this could actually be. Therefore, her methotrexate is maxed to, um, to 25 milligrams a week, switched to subcutaneous to help increase the theoretical bioavailability. And she is um, given instructions to apply for the Humira assistance program, and that's started every two weeks. She's also given samples of Humira to help her along the way. However, four months later, um, while, although she's improving initially, her scleritis in the right eye flares much more severely, also followed by, for the first time, peripheral ulcerative keratitis in this eye. I don't have a picture, unfortunately, at this point, but you can see that she's got marginal ulceration of the right cornea with also some epithelial loss and uh, uh, fluorescein staining. So she started an oral prednisone, this is not great for her diabetes. And also she's developed GI bleeding on prednisone. 
her Humira, which is um, conventionally prescribed every two weeks, is increased to weekly with some evidence that that can increase some disease uh, remission in people who are unresponsive or minimally responsive to every two weeks. However, during this process, she keeps running out of Humira samples and sometimes the methotrexate, which she's paying for out of pocket. And so the idea is maybe this isn't the best regimen for her. So she is um, moved to apply for uh, infliximab or Remicade assistance with the idea that this is an infusion that she'll get at the hospital every four weeks. Maybe that's a little bit uh, more helpful for her to get it. She stops the Humira um, and she starts infliximab at 10 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks. And five months after this, however, her left eye now starts to develop PUK. So this is what it looks like. Um, she, uh, with this would indicate that she is also inadequately controlled um, at the current dose of um, infliximab, even though she's been receiving this reliably. So she has started on oral prednisone again. Um, her infliximab has increased even farther to 15 milligrams per kilogram as to tide her over while she is waiting for approval um, for, her, for the manufacturer of rituximab to approve her for assistance as well. When approved, um, she, she has switched to rituximab. Rituximab is given uh, in two doses and then uh, six months later is her next dose. So um, she is uh, actually doing well on this. The reason for um, choice, choosing rituximab in these cases is partly because there's uh, evidence for the last several years that rituximab is particularly effective in patients with scleritis and peripheral ulcerative keratitis, as well as initially in rheumatoid arthritis as well. So we have something that could potentially treat all three of her conditions. Um, in this review by Dr. Cunningham, um, they looked at 110, 120 patients with uh, scleritis who were treated with rituximab and 112 of them, so 93%, had a positive response. So pretty good. PUK is a little less common, but the evidence we have, let me try to move that away. I can't get down. Um, suggests that of, of the patients uh, who were treated with anti-TNF inhibitors, such as Humira or infliximab with PUK, about half of them had to switch uh, to a different agent to achieve disease control over the first year, but all of those who were treated with rituximab did not. The idea behind this is that scleritis and uh, PUK are considered a vasculitic process and uh, rituximab is particularly eff efficacious in these conditions. However, you'll also note in the same picture that she's got more going on in her PUK. She's also got a pretty dense cataract. Her vision as at best 2070 in both eyes. And she's been on and off topical and systemic steroids for the last year or so. So um, now that she is under good control for several months on rituximab, um, without arthritis, scleritis, or PUK, she signed up for cataract surgery. I got this video from Dr. Chaya, so kudos to him. Um, you can see here that the uh, main wound is made directly through the PUK, which causes a little bit of leakage around the uh, 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 PUK tip, which means that during the surgery, uh, they have to sew up the sides of the wounds to en en uh, enable the rest of the nucleus removal, making the surgery a little bit more interesting. And at the end, all of the um, pairs, including, also have to be tied down. So PUK does not make easy for easy cataract surgery. However, she does well, and postoperatively in both eyes, uh, she's on corrected 2030 vision, um, and she has maintained disease stability and sense on rituximab every six months and methotrexate weekly. So just some lessons um, that this uh, patient taught us. Um, local and systemic therapy each have their own side effects, such as the cataracts uh, that her uh, drops have caused, as well as the GI bleeding that her oral prednisone has caused. Options for escalating treatment with IMT include uh, increasing the dose or frequency, as was done with infliximab and Humira. I'm switching to a medication in the same class, such as Humira and infliximab, or switching to a different class of therapy like the uh, CD20 antibody uh, rituximab. Um, patients with uveitis and systemic disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, have approved indications for uh, several IMT options, but this, of course, requires close co management um, with our colleagues in rheumatology, dermatology, and oncology. Sometimes the best treatment is the one that the patient can get. And visual rehabilitation with cataract surgery and uveitis requires complete disease quiescence for three months to achieve optimal outcomes. So here are my references, and thank you to all the people who are helping take care of her. Okay, I'll be pre I'm Marissa La Rochelle, I'm one of the uveitis faculty here, and I'll be presenting the next case, which has its own set of distinct challenges and differences. 
This is a 60 year old man that was referred to the uveitis clinic for birdshot chorioretinopathy. As we know, birdshot's really a prototype of an ocular inflammatory disease that has a specific phenotype and a strong HLA association, but no systemic rheumatologic disease associated with it. And it has a known course without treatment of causing progressive visual decline from visual field loss and nyctalopia or night blindness with an abnormal ERG. It's characterized by these deep hypopigmented lesions. I don't know if I can get a pointer here. You can see that for the rheumatologists in the crowd, there's these deep sort of yellowish spots scattered throughout the posterior pole. As someone described it sort of as a, as a bird shot, like a gunshot pattern. So it has this, this, um, this name bird shot. And um, this patient also had a diagnosis of hypertension, but no other past medical history. On the fluorescein angiography, the photo on the on the left of the screen, we can see some segmental perifibulitis indicating active disease. He has nerve edema and some angiographic CME. And then the photo on your right is an ICG, and we can see some small hypofluorescent spots indicative of birdshot. Vision was slightly declined 2050 in the right eye, 2030 in the left eye, with elevated intraocular pressure of 35 and 31. Normal is 10 to 21. And in this photo, we can see a macular OCT with an epiretinal membrane, which is this line on top, and then cystoid macular edema, which are the dark circles here. The patient is already on max dose of methotrexate, 25 milligrams oral weekly in conjunction with rheumatology, and his drops include three antihypertensive agents. COSOPT is a combination agent, and then bromonidine. Um, in, in hopes of treating the ocular hypertension, and he's on a topical steroid and a topical NSAID for the macular edema. So our recommendations at this point is to switch the oral methotrexate to the subcutaneous form, increasing bioavailability, and then starting adalimumab, and that was bridged with an oral prednisone taper, and then in hopes of treating or at least helping the ocular hypertension, trying to taper him off of the ocular um, steroids, the topical prednisolone. The macular edema did improve, but didn't completely resolve. And the patient lives in Nevada. At some point, his pressure was checked locally, and it was still high despite top tapering off the topical steroids. So he was started on Diamox. And unfortunately, the patient was suffering from one of the common side effects of oral prednisone, which can be mood disturbances. He described feeling very angry or almost homicidal towards one of his roommates. So um, we are sort of left with the situation of a bilateral posterior uveitis with no known systemic disease that has improved but not completely resolved on our first two lines of treatment therapy being an anti-metabolite and um, adalimumab, and he still has macular edema. So in this case, the, the local therapy has the, the negative side effects of raising intraocular pressure. We could try a surgical intervention, such as a pars plane of vitrectomy with a membrane peel to relieve some of the tractional component of that macular edema from the epiretinal membrane. Um, the patient is phacic, however, so we know that pars plane of vitrectomy and definitely a retisert would induce a cataract requiring surgery. And the retisert also tends to worsen the intraocular pressure leading to incisional glaucoma surgery. And systemic therapy also has its side effects that we have to deal with. So the psychiatric issues with the oral prednisone is this patient experienced. Cyclosporin is an agent that we can add as a, a third line in some patients for adjunctive therapy. However, he already has baseline hypertension and we know the cyclosporin, cyclosporin can exacerbate that. Um, and so we move on to other potential biologics which um, have, can be difficult in, in getting approved for uveitis alone. So our recommendation is to try a flibercept. That's an anti-VEGF intraocular injection aimed at macular edema um, that does not have the issue with the, the steroids inducing IOP elevation. And we started authorization for tocilizumab. And tocilizumab is thought to, um, IL-6 is thought to increase circulating levels of VEGF. And so IL-6 inhibition, inhibition then can act as a systemic anti-VEGF agent. This is a 24 month study of 16 eyes in 12 patients with refractory uveitic macular edema. In these patients, the uveitis itself was quiet, quiet, but the macular edema was persistent. And it was longstanding in the study, the macular edema was present actually for over 13 years. And all the patients had been previously treated with other IMT agents. And then they were initiated on tocilizumab 
IV infusion, eight mgs per kg every four weeks, and the outcome was um, a significant reduction in central macular thickness seen at one month and sustained through 12 months. So for our patient after the aflibercept injections, they did have resolution of the macular edema despite that epiretinal membrane in the right eye. However, the left eye still had some persistent cysts and they were awaiting approval of the tocilizumab at this point. So this case really highlights a real world patient with a, a challenging ocular systemic disease, or sorry, an ocular inflammatory disease without a systemic disease. Um, Rachel mentioned some of the techniques we use to advance immunosuppression, such as increasing dose of frequency, switching medications, switching classes. And with this one, we saw that we switched the route of administration in hopes of improving bioavailability and then selecting a, a, a third agent with particular efficacy against macular edema. And so um, we really rely on our colleagues um, in the rheumatology department. We think these cases, once we move through the first and second line agents that we have a lot of experience in prescribing, albeit off-label with the exception of adalimumab, and then we get to agents like tocilizumab um, that, that don't have a specific approval for, but it's used to treat these ocular inflammatory diseases that really are vision-threatening. And so the best approach to these are, is a, a sort of hand-in-hand -hand collaboration with the rheumatology department and the uveitis department to get these patients through these extra um, line of therapy that ultimately saves their vision. So we really appreciate the work that the rheumatologists do with us to help care for these very challenging patients. Thank you. Are there uh, any questions or uh, points that anybody want to raise about this? I mean, they, as Marissa is saying, it's real world stuff. about what we can do, but, you know, we're often, our hands are often tied, you know, by what we can get available, or by what the patient can afford, what the insurance will cover, uh, and by the side effects of medication. And for both, you know, ocular only or systemic disease, it, you know, it's unfortunate. Sorry, for both ocular and systemic disease. So, you know, we're talking about vision-threatening inflammation, no matter how you cut it. So um, it's, it's difficult. So, you, you know, you have on the one hand, you know, yay, Humira has been approved, you know, now what? You know, I mean, Humira doesn't, is not a magic bullet. It doesn't induce remission in most patients. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, you know, I, in this patient, uh, there are uveitis practitioners that would present the patient and say, look, you know, we can't get systemic, uh, uh, Alternatives approved. Um, Redisert works really well uh, for uh, you know for this disease for birdshot retinochordopathy. We're going to bite the bullet and uh, you know do a combined phago tube in, in the eye, uh, and the patient might do well. But it's a lot of surgery, right, in a phago patient, and then with an epiretinal membrane. So uh, my uh, kind of approach. Would be, I mean, if you're up, if you're against the wall, then maybe that's what you have to do. But I think it makes sense to try to avoid creating complications, okay, rather than you know, uh, you know, and, and treating them with agents that are alternative. So in any case, I'm really, really pleased that uh, Dr. Pimenta is here. Uh, he has been a great colleague and uh, collaborator with many, many patients, uh, with particularly you know, with uh, ankylosing uh, spondylitis and. Uh, HLA-B27 associated disease, but much more. So he was certainly, he was very involved in that first case uh, that we had and uh, really I, I went to bat for this patient. So, you know, he, we have a patient that doesn't have insurance. We try to pull out all the stops and, at the Moran end, uh, the Department of Rheumatology to help, help our patients with both systemic ocular disease. So I give you Dr. Penmetzer. I want to thank Dr. Vitaly and Marissa for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to focus more on the biologic therapies, what we have on the rheumatology side, and which also 
work really well for uveitis in autoimmune diseases. But I also want to briefly talk about the epidemiology, the immunopathology, because that's what helps us understand why these biologics do work in different forms of uveitis. We often encounter both in the uveitis clinic and the rheumatology clinic. So we know rheumatologic diseases can manifest as a variety of ophthalmology conditions from uveitis, scleritis, retinal vasculitis, and xerophthalmia. And we know, uh, like listed here, so predominantly every rheumatologic disease we take care of can cause some form of ocular manifestation. But the most common ones we see are ankylosing spondylitis, Okay, so as like I said, we know several rheumatologic conditions can cause different forms of ocular inflammation, but predominantly the most common ones we encounter in our rheumatology practice are ankylosing spondylitis, JIA, sarcoidosis, and HLA B27 spondyl arthritis, which are the common cause of uveitis. We know that the coexistence of uveitis and arthritis happens quite frequently, and this suggests there's some shared pathogenesis happening in these two conditions. This also uh, is better understood because we know these inflammatory cytokines like TNF, IL-6, IL-17, they've been associated with increased evidence in inflammatory eye conditions. We also know both ankylosing spondylitis and uveitis patients share so many common risk factors like B27, IL-23 receptors, polymorphisms, and uh, ERAP uh, halotypes as well. So this was a meta-analysis which looked at the different prevalence of rheumatologic conditions all over the world. And it highlights that some rheumatologic conditions are more likely to cause uveitis the most common one is HLA-B27, and it showed the prevalence of this in uveitis cohorts could be anywhere from 2% to 11%. Predominantly in Caucasians, this can be a significant cause of uveitis. JIA, sarcoidosis, and ankylosing spondylitis are also very commonly associated with uveitis. And Bechet's is of importance because these patients can have severe forms of panuveitis, which can complicate uh, vision due to retinal vasculitis and macular edema. So talking about the immunopathology, the majority of the inflammatory diseases, they happen due to dysregulation of your innate and your adaptive immune system, and which includes your macrophages, your B cells, your T cells, and dendritic cells. And the end result of this dysregulation results in production of multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines like a tumor necrosis factor, IL-6, IL-17, and interferon. However, the primary cytokine target from changes with different inflammatory diseases. On the right, this demonstrates the different cytokines which are associated with the pathogenesis in patients, HLA-B27, and sarcoidosis. But the one common factor in all these three is TNF alpha, and that explains why TNF inhibitors seem to be effective in Bechet's HLA-B27 spondyl arthritis. And even in sarcoidosis, we use it in off-label when patients do not respond to methotrexate. But if you look further down, there are differences in the underlying pathology. In sarcoidosis, macrophages play a huge role. They secrete serum amyloid, which causes the granulomas and the inflammatory response. Whereas in HLA-B27, it's predominantly the TH17 cells, which secrete IL-17 and TNF-alpha. And whereas in Bechet's, it's the combination of CD8 T cells and the TH17 cells. And you can see there's a, a multiple cytokines involved in the pathogenesis, and that could explain the severity of uveitis in Bechet's disease. So immunosuppressive therapies uh, have been successful in reducing the severity of uveitis and also induce remission. But the choice of immunosuppressive therapy 
differs based on the underlying rheumatologic condition and the severity of uveitis. And this is where it's important for the rheumatologist coordinate with the ophthalmologist to identify which is the most appropriate therapeutic agent for each individual patient. And this therapy should be considered promptly in patients with recalcitrant or iterating uveitis, or if disease questions cannot be obtained with corticosteroids. And as ophthalmologists, we in rheumatology were also concerned about prolonged courses of steroids. So in patients who are unable to achieve quiescence on glucocorticoids, we would like to use a steroid sparing agent to reduce long-term toxicity. So methotrexate, mycophenolate, and azathioprine are the most commonly used non-biologic immune suppressive therapies. I just mentioned the MUST trial, but Dr. Vitaly talked about it. I'm going to skip this, but this did confirm that patients on systemic immune suppressive therapy definitely uh, do better in the long term compared to the intravitreous eosinolone. So, however, the treating provider should review the patient's comorbidities, the medication interactions, and accessory factors of toxicity before choosing appropriate immune suppressive therapy. And methotrexate is the first choice of systemic immune therapy, but there are certain individuals where we should avoid methotrexate. If they have prior liver disease or previous exposure to hep B or C, we should avoid methotrexate. Azathioprine is a good alternative for methotrexate, but it's common practice in rheumatology. We check thiopurine methyltransferase enzyme levels before we initiate azathioprine. So a small group of patients who are low on TPMT level, there's significant risk of azathioprine toxicity where it can cause severe bone marrow suppression and result in pancytopenia. So we like to make sure they have adequate TPMT levels before we initiate azathioprine. So this slide summarizes the evidence for different immune suppressive therapies, which are shown to treat several different types of uveitis. The most data is available for mycophenolate, which is shown in like 13 different either case series or small studies where it's very effective. It not only controls inflammation, it also improves visual acuity. Similarly, as a type, and also is shown to be effective to treat. However, it's not as effective in improving visual acuity, but it's shown to be very good to reduce inflammation. And methotrexate is also very effective. I also listed cyclophosphamide and calcium inhibitors, but they have not been used as much lately because of the emergence of all the biologic therapies. So that has reduced the need for cyclophosphamide and calcineurin inhibitors. So anti-TNF agents were the first biologic therapy we approved for rheumatoid arthritis and that revolutionized how we treat rheumatologic diseases. So these biologic DMARs are often considered when patients fail systemic immune therapies like methotrexate or azathioprine. And adalumab was the first agent which was approved for uveitis and visual one and the visual two trials, as Dr. Vitaly mentioned, proved the safety and efficacy. So there was one study called Cytomore study. This looked at the effects of as adalumumab plus methotrexate versus methotrexate alone in GI patients with refractory uveitis. And this also confirmed adalumumab is very effective in inducing remission in GI patients with refractory uveitis. There was one comparative study which was done in Bechet's disease with refractory uveitis, and they compared infliximab versus adalumumab, and they had 177 cases of Bechet's disease with refractory uveitis and failed steroids and immune suppressive therapy. And in this uh, study, they followed up after one year and it showed adalumumab appears to be uh, associated with better outcomes compared to infliximab. So from this study and other case series, adalumumab became the first choice anti-TNF agent. And in patients who fail adalumumab, we often pursue infliximab. So there are certain advantages with infliximab. So one is it offers you to do a weight-based dosing and you can also titrate dose 
anywhere from five milligrams up to 10 milligrams. And rarely we can do up to 15 milligrams like we did in the previous patient. So patients who are uh, in consistent uh, refractory uveitis with no response to adalumumab, infliximab offers a great opportunities. So I want to quickly mention sertolizumab. So the one good indication of cert so sertolizumab is in pregnant women, as there is no placental transfer of sertolizumab from moms to infants. So this is the preferred anti-TNF agent in pregnant women who need a biologic agent. So this table also shows you the evidence of the different studies which prove the efficacy of infliximab, adalumumab, and golimumab. So infliximab has shown to be very effective to treat different types of anterior, posterior uveitis complicated by retinal vasculitis. It's also shown to be very effective to treat Bichette's disease and sarcoidosis patients with non-infectious uveitis. It's also shown to be effective to treat VKH disease and birdshot chorioretinopathy. All of these are off-label use, but definitely there is enough evidence to show infliximab and adalubimab are good alternative therapies for patients with refractory uveitis. However, we are running into trouble because there are a lot of patients who do not respond to an anti-TNF agent. So data from the RA trial showed us that 25 to 40 percent of the patients do not respond to an anti-TNF agent. So this is where it gets tricky, what will be the next choice of treatment. So the TNF non-responders, we either deal with the primary non-responders or secondary non-responders. So these are people who had minimal or no response to an anti-TNF agent. Most likely these patients, the disease process is not driven by a TNF dependent pathway and that explains a lack of response. The data from RA trial shows that in primary non-responders, we do not recommend cycling through multiple TNF agents because either they're not going to improve the clinical response or you're risking disease progression. So in primary non-responders, we recommend to switch to different class of biologics. In secondary non-responders, these are patients that have a good initial response, but over time, they lose therapeutic response. This can happen either due to the patient develop a neutralizing antibody to the uh, monoclonal antibody or there was disease progression. In these patients, you can try dose escalation, like if a patient is on Himara every two weeks, we can try to do it weekly or switch to infliximab and try high dosing infusions. And this lists several reasons why a patient may not respond uh, to a certain biologic agent. So this is a flowchart of how we can manage patients who fail an anti-TNF blocker. So in patients who had active RA and they try the TNF blocker, and if they do not respond to a, a initial anti-TNF agent, the options we have are abatacept, rituximab, and tocilizumab. So in patients who have a positive rheumatoid factor and a positive CCP antibody, studies showed they have a better chance of responding to rituximab. However, if the patients are negative for CCP antibody, they may not respond to rituximab. In those, you would either choose abatacept or tocilizumab. If a, this patient is a secondary non-responder, you can still consider a second TNF blocker, or you can just switch to a different class of medication. And further down, if they do not respond to any of these biologics, you, know, you can pursue the JAK inhibitors, which have been very effective for RA and other inflammatory arthritis. So this is a flowchart of what we have available options for HLA-B27 uveitis. Unfortunately, the options are limited in this patient population. And so the managing TNF non-responders can be a little bit tricky. If they fail Humira 40 milligrams every two weeks, we still pursue either infliximab or symphony because the data on IL-17 inhibitors is still inconclusive. So we either uh, initiate infliximab or switch over to symphony. One other option is if patient has well-controlled AS and if it's predominantly to manage uveitis, we can add methotrexate or mycophenolate, and that has shown to be efficacious to 
control uveitis. If patient fails another anti-TNF agent, then we are bound to switch to an IL-17 inhibitor. So the evidence of IL-17 inhibitor acid is still inconclusive. So if you're using this to treat recurrent uveitis, the recommendation is used to combine with methotrexate to improve the outcomes. And JAK inhibitors are also now approved for HLA-B27 spondyloarthritis. So I want to talk about each cytokine inhibitor. So IL-17 inhibitors, they have an important role in spondyloarthritis and autoimmune uveitis. And TH17 cells are the major source of IL-17. We also have data from animal models and human models which suggest IL-17 is an important cytokine in uveitis. So we have two different IL-17 antagonists, secukinumab and ixekinumab, and they're shown to be very effective in psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, and psoriatic arthritis. So both the secukinumab and ixekinumab predominantly block IL-17A, which is the most important isoform of IL-17. However, these IL-17 agents don't seem to help in RA or Crohn's disease or refractory uveitis. So there have been some studies uh, for IL-17 inhibitors in uveitis patients. So there were three randomized studies which looked at the evidence of secukinumab in uveitis patients. Unfortunately, the primary outcome did not show any difference in the uveitis recurrence between the treatment group and the placebo group. However, on further analysis, the secondary efficacy data did suggest that secukinumab does have a beneficial effect in reducing the use of concomitant immune suppressing medications. So Dr. Deodar and et al, what they did was they did a pool analysis to study the incidence of uveitis in the trials of secukinumab. In pool analysis, they found the incident rates of uveitis was 1.4 episodes per 100 patient years. Majority of these patients are HLA-B27 and 17% of them had prior history of uveitis. So they compared the exposure adjusted incident rates of IL-17 with TNF agents. In TNF agents, the incident rates were 2.6 to 3.5 per 100 patient years. So their difference wasn't bad. So overall, this pool analysis suggested that there is no increased risk of uveitis in secukinumab exposed cohorts. IL-12 and IL-23 uh, cytokines are also associated with inflammatory diseases. So astikinumab is the only IL-12 and 23 monoclonal antibody which is approved to treat psoriasis, PSA, and Crohn's disease. There are multiple monoclonal antibodies which target the P19 subunit of IL-23, but it does not block IL-12. These monoclonal antibodies seem to have a very limited role. They're only proven to be effective in psoriasis. And unfortunately, this IL-23 inhibition did not seem to work in axial spondyloarthritis. So overall, we know that IL-23 inhibition may have a role in uveitis, but currently we don't have enough evidence to support the use in refractory uveitis. I think there are some few small case series of which used astekinumab in Bechet's disease with some uh, improved outcomes. So this slide summarizes the different IL-12-23 antibodies and IL-17 antibodies. So the secukinumab and exekinumab has been approved by FDA for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Astekinumab, which I mentioned earlier, blocks IL-1223, also is very effective in psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and it's also effective in Crohn's disease. But these IL-23 monoclonal antibodies have a limited efficacy in psoriasis. So this briefly summarizes the algorithm of approach for treating uveitis in JIA. So I'm going to skip the stop part like Dr. Whitehall, you already mentioned if you fail systemic steroids and you can initiate azathioprine or methotrexate. But once you try a systemic immune suppressor therapy, if uh, patients continue to have refractory uveitis, you can 
considered adalimumab or infliximab or golimumab. As I mentioned, adalimumab is the preferred agent which has superior efficacy compared to infliximab. If patients fail this, you can switch over to abatacept, rituximab, or betoseluzumab. So IL-16 inhibitors. So studies showed patients who have glaucoma or ocular inflammatory diseases, they have elevated serum IL-6 levels. IL-6 is also associated with complications like neovascularization and macular edema. So in patients who have uveitis secondary to RA, JIA, tocilizumab is shown to be very effective in inducing remission. T tocilizumab is only approved for RA, JIA, GCA, but it's quite often used off-label in patients' disease, Takayasu, Stills disease, and relapsing polychondritis. The common adverse effects associated with this are upper respiratory infections, neutropenia, and gastrointestinal perforation. So patients who have history of diverticulitis or gastrointestinal perforation, they should avoid tocilizumab. The other IL-6 and monoclonal antibody is serilumumab, which is also approved for RA. And it's also shown to be very effective to treat non-infectious uveitis. And also want to quickly list that there are several other inflammatory diseases which are shown to respond to IL-6 inhibition. So there have been few randomized control styles which study the efficacy of tocilizumab. One of them is the stop uveitis. And there was other study predominantly uh, in refractory uveitis in GIA patients, which also confirmed efficacy and safety of tocilizumab. In RA trials, we know both subcutaneous tocilizumab and intravenous tocilizumab are equally effective. However, in uveitis patients, IV tocilizumab is preferred over subcutaneous tocilizumab. So there was one case series of refractory uveitis where they compared IV versus subcutaneous tocilizumab. So these patients initially sustained remission with IV tocilizumab, but when they were switched over to subcutaneous tocilizumab, they had relapse of uveitis. So from this data, uh, it's been uh, decided that IV tocilizumab is the preferred uh, compared to subcutaneous injections. So T cell inhibitors, briefly, the one agent we have is abatacept, which binds to CD86 and inhibits T cell activation. It's only approved for RA. It can be used in TNF-naive RA and also patients who fail anti-TNF uh, agents. So abatacept has been shown in small case series to be very effective to treat refractory uveitis in JIA patients. IL-1 inhibitors have been approved in the last decade. So IL-1 is a primary cytokine that's involved in rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so IL-1 inhibitors are approved in systemic JIA, adults on the Stills disease, but it's still of label for several conditions like Bechet's, uveitis, and other autoinflammatory syndromes. So we have anakindra and canakinumab, which are very effective to treat Bechet's related uveitis. So rituximab is a CD20 inhibitor, which has been shown to be very effective for rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the pioneering trials is the Reflex trial. So there are several different dosings of rituximab, but the one we often use in rheumatology is 1,000 milligrams times two doses on day one and day 15. The other is the weekly dosing, 375 milligrams per meter square, which is still often used sometimes in ankle vasculitis. So rituximab is recommended for patients if they fail one or two anti-TNF agents. It's also approved for inflammatory myositis and ankle vasculitis, but Rituximab has now become one of the go-to medication for patients with systemic lupus erythematosus or systemic sclerosis with uh, systemic organ involvement like interstitial lung disease or lupus nephritis, but it's still off-label as of now. So 
we predominantly use the 1000 milligram two doses, but there have been some trials to compare low dose Dexmab, which is 500 milligram two doses versus the 1000 milligrams. And in this study, the most of the outcomes favored the high dose Dexmab. However, low dose Dexmab can be considered for maintenance treatment in patients who had a good response with initial therapies. So the maintenance treatment is every six months for active disease. However, in patients who had remission in initially, you can wait and monitor the, for disease activity and you can delay the maintenance of infusions if patients are not manifesting any active disease. So one of the advantages of Ritexmab is they have a sustained treatment response for up to six months or beyond, but however, it should be used with caution due to the increased infection and infusion reactions. So this was one study which looked at the long-term outcomes of Ritexmab and which has shown to be very effective for non-infectious posterior uveitis. And the majority of these patients had either pan-uveitis with combined retinal vasculitis due to lupus or granulum of uh, polyangitis and HLA-B27. In all of these patients, they had a good response to rituximab. So rituximab can also be considered for other inflammatory conditions we see in the setting of lupus and ankle vasculitis. So biosimilars are available for rituximab and hopefully that will reduce the cost of these biologics. So JAK inhibitors have been uh, approved for RA, AS, and PSA in the last decade, but there have been several other JAK inhibitors currently being studied in GI, hematology, and dermatology. So the current approved JAK inhibitors include tofacitinib, baricitinib, and ifacitinib, and they all block different giant kinases and all of them have shown to be very effective to treat uh, RA refractory to biologic therapies. There have been some case reports of patients with refractory HLA-B27 uveitis and JIA patients who failed TNF blockers, rituximab and tocilizumab. In these case reports, patients who were either tried tofacitinib or baricitinib were able to achieve remission of uveitis. However, there are still ongoing randomized control trials to confirm efficacy. Currently, patients who fail multiple therapies can be considered for either tofacitinib or baricitinib. So this lists the history of the approval of tofacitinib and the different JAK inhibitors over the last decade. But there is a word of caution which has come to light in the last two years. So tofacitinib was first approved in 2012 and it was like a game changer and most of the rheumatologists were excited to use in some refractory patients. However, FDA announced box warning last year that JAK inhibitors are associated with increased risk of cardiac events, blood clots and cancer. So this comes from an oral surveillance study in patients who received tofacitinib and they had demonstrated increased risk of major cardiovascular events, thrombotic events, malignancy compared to TNF inhibitors. So ACR released a statement earlier this year that JAK inhibitors should be used with caution in RA, PSA, and AS if they had inadequate response or intolerance. In certain patients like smokers, men, older than 65 who have a prior cardiovascular event or stroke, you should or try other biologic agents before you consider a JAK inhibitor. So last, optimization of biologic. So there have been some studies going on to see, can we reduce the frequency and the dosing of biologics to potentially reduce the healthcare costs and also reduce the risk of side effects? So several trials have been done in rheumatologic conditions. All of them showed that you can do careful down titration of biologics and still maintain therapeutic response with no flare ups. But the one thing we learned from this is you should never withdraw biologics because they have a high risk of relapse. So there was one study which looked at optimization of adalumumab in refractory uveitis patients due to Bechet's. In these patients, physicians were able to reduce the frequency of adalumumab down up to four to six weeks without relapse. So patients who had successful remission on biologics, you can consider 
either prolonging the dosing interval or reducing the dose with closed monitoring. And quickly, what are the challenges we face day to day? You know, one of the big things I did not mention here is the cost. So we have so many patients who are either uninsured or their insurance doesn't pay for biologics. So we often have difficult decisions how we can provide them the right therapy. But beyond that, as the treating providers, we need to understand the patient's underlying comorbidities, their prior exposure to infections and immunization status before we choose appropriate therapy. Patients who have stage four or stage five CHF, if they have demyelinating neurologic diseases, malignancy or prior infections like latent TB, we should avoid anti-TNF agents. And we sh should make sure all of them receive appropriate immunizations before we initiate biologic therapies. And thankfully we have pharmacists in our clinic who help us review patient information and help us in make their up-to-date in all the vaccines. So there is some data that reactivation of TB is less in IL-17 inhibitors. So if you, somebody have a latent TB, IL-17 inhibitors can be used prior to TNF agents. And obviously the COVID pandemic has been a difficult period for everyone in the last two years. And one of the challenges we've been having is several patients have to switch to tocilizumab because of lack of availability and it's slowly getting better. And finally, JAK inhibitors are the way to go, but we should avoid them in high risk patients until we get further data. And thank you so much. It went over time and I'm open for questions.